Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Jamie Kinney. I'm the principal product manager for batch and high performance computing at Amazon. And I'd like to thank you for attending our, our talk today. Uh, we're going to be joined by, by several people, a uh, few of whom are on the stage today. Uh, so we'll have three of our, of our customers presenting on their, their usage of AWS Batch. Uh, we're going to, uh, from AdRoll, have uh, Miko Yola uh, in, in the red shirt over here. Uh, Oleg's uh, uh, in the front row over there. He'll be joining us for, for Q&A at the end. Uh, from Base2 Genomics, uh, Ryan's going to be presenting. Uh, and also joined by uh, Aaron uh, Quinlan and, and Brent Peterson, also sitting in, in the, the front desk, uh, all three co-founders of Base2. Uh, and then uh, Dinu from, from Autodesk. Uh, so thank you for, for joining us today. So for today's talk, uh, I wanted to uh, just start off with a, a quick recap of some of the features that we, we've launched with AWS Batch over the past year, uh, bring you up to speed on, on uh, what's new in the, in the 12 months since we launched the service at last year's reInvent. Uh, before going into a, a glimpse of our, our roadmap, talking about it, um, in depth about a feature that we, we've actually just launched in the past 30 minutes, um, and then go into, into detail on how our actual customers are, are using the service and, and give them the majority of the time today, uh, before, uh, of course, saving some time for, for Q&A. Uh, so just a, a quick reminder and talking about uh, what led us to, to build the AWS Batch service. Um, oh, we're, can we switch? I'll do it. Sorry. Um, AWS Batch, um, as, as you probably know, uh, given your interest in the session, uh, is a service that we launched last year with a goal of, of, of helping you uh, greatly simplify batch processing in the cloud. Uh, if you had wanted to run batch processing workloads on Amazon uh, before we launched the AWS Batch service, um, and you worked with us, we would likely have instructed you on how to combine about a dozen different services. And we recognized after helping tens of, if not hundreds of customers implement very similar solutions, uh, that we really needed to, to help uh, by offering higher level primitives. And so the, the goal of AWS Batch is to provide a, a fully managed platform that helps you reduce cost by making it easy to take advantage of, of low cost EC2 spot instances, uh, by automatically scaling up and down resources, uh, taking advantage of things like per second billing, uh, which, which we, we launched in the past year, and also making it very easy for your jobs to securely and easily uh, authenticate and, and leverage other services offered by Amazon, things like Amazon DynamoDB or, or recognition. And so now getting into the, the summary of the launches for the past year. When we launched Batch uh, this time last year, we, we launched in the US East 1 uh, Northern Virginia region. We're now in, in nine regions in total. Um, and you can expect that we'll, we'll continue that regional expansion, getting into the remainder of, of AWS regions um, early in, in 2018. Uh, we had a big focus uh, very early on to, to make managed compute environments work better in Batch. Uh, for many of you, we, we heard that it was important that not only do we support the ECS-optimized Amazon machine image, but that we also give you the freedom to be able to provide your own machine image in, in managed compute environments. And in doing so, we give you the ability to do things like automatically mount elastic file systems, uh, to be able to uh, configure encryption um, in, in the way that you prefer, to be able to use the operating system of your choice, um, to be able to use more, faster, bigger, uh, different types of, of EBS volumes, um, as well as if you want to run uh, GPU or, or FPGA accelerated workloads. It's a very important capability. So that was added back in March. Uh, and then over the course of the year, um, at, and up to even today, uh, we've, we've worked to support additional instance types as, they've, as they become available. So as of today, you can also now, of course, uh, launch uh, the C5 instances in your managed compute environments. Um, and then a, a major uh, area that we focused on uh, is the way that scheduling and, and resource provisioning works within AWS Batch. Uh, when we first envisioned the service, our, our target was to support jobs that lasted for 15 minutes or longer. And uh, on, on day one, uh, probably a few people in the room started submitting jobs that lasted only a fraction of a second and wondered why we weren't very efficient at, at, at utilizing the resources that we were scaling up. Uh, and, and so we, we, we focused pretty, uh, pretty heavily over the course of the past year to support shorter duration jobs. And so now with uh, jobs that last as short as just a couple of seconds, um, we can easily obtain about 90% utilization of the compute resources that we provision for you. So uh, Batch is now a platform that can handle jobs lasting just a couple of seconds to, to months, if you like. Um, and then finally, um, uh, additional capabilities around uh, tagging uh, both you know, spot and, and non-spot resources. Uh, on the manageability side, we added the ability to automatically retry jobs. So if your job fails due to a spot termination or if you have an application <clears throat> error, um, you can, with your, your job submission, specify a number of times that you'd like us to retry your job. If it fails, we'll move it back to the head of the queue. 
And then uh, added support within AWS CloudFormation. Terraform also supports AWS Batch. Um, and a, a big launch was the ability to use event-driven models with, with AWS Batch. So uh, and, th and that means two things. Um, on one side, it's being able to receive events as your jobs transition from one state to another. So when your job uh, goes from runnable to starting to running, at each of those state transitions, we'll emit an event telling you the time that occurred, the new state of your, of your job, uh, and the payload will include the uh, output of the described jobs API response. And that means that you can then set up filters that say, tell me about any job that failed with this particular uh, uh, failure code, and, uh, and maybe send this to an SNS queue so that I can do manual investigation of this. Or if I have a, a job that matches a particular job definition and it succeeds, send me an event so that I can then trigger a, a step functions uh, flow to uh, perform additional operations. So that, that's one side of the event-driven architecture. Um, uh, we'll talk in a little bit as we get into the roadmap about future capabilities that um, allow Batch to be uh, used in response to events that are being generated. Um, and then on the, the regulatory and compliance front, uh, uh, we focused very early on in the service to ensure that Batch is covered as part of the, the HIPAA Business Associates Agreement. Uh, we're working on additional certifications um, and additional auditing and, and compliance capabilities for Batch. Uh, very important, as you'll, you'll hear from Base2 Genomics in just a bit. Um, and then getting back to the original design of Batch, uh, when we were talking to a number of, of early uh, beta customers of, of AWS Batch, we wondered if we should have an API for submitting workflows or, or DAGs in addition to the submit job API that we have today. And uh, in those conversations, uh, it became pretty clear that we, we sh probably shouldn't be too opinionated about how workflows are executed uh, that, that would you know, be executed by AWS Batch. And so we focused on a model that lets you express interdependencies between jobs. So submit jobs one, two, and three, telling us that three depends on two and two depends on one. Um, so if you have a very deterministic workflow, uh, you, can, you can manage that fully with an AWS batch. If, on the other hand, you're, you, you have a more complex workflow or, or, or non-deterministic workflow, uh, that's where integration with step functions comes into play. And so we had a, a very popular compute blog post uh, with a, a corresponding GitHub repo that shows you exactly how to integrate uh, AWS step functions or the workflow engine of your choice with AWS batch. Um, in this time, using uh, Lambda, as the uh, intermediary between step functions and AWS Batch. So you have, um, as, as you, you know, proceed from, from state to state within your, your, your step functions workflow, uh, Lambda functions are invoked, which will call the submit job API for AWS Batch. Uh, we have a, a pattern or a blueprint in the Lambda console that makes it easy for you to both submit jobs and, and query the, the status of your jobs. Now that we've moved to an event-driven model, um, instead of having to pull every 30 seconds, say, for the status of your jobs, you can simply have step functions listen for the event that we emit when your job uh, either succeeds or fails. Now, uh, that, that's really helpful, but uh, we have a lot of customers that are, are running thousands and, and tens of thousands of, of jobs on, on AWS Batch on, on a daily basis, and we thought that there was a way that we could, we could simplify this as well. And so we hinted about this a, a little bit when we announced the service, uh, but, but happy to announce that today uh, we have a, a new feature for Batch called Array Jobs. So Array Jobs is a way for you to very easily, with a single submit job API call, uh, submit 10,000 copies of, of a job. So every job is identical in terms of the, the command that it executes, the CPU and memory, the environment variables, the parameters, uh, everything else associated with the job, um, except that we'll, we'll create as many copies as we've specified, up, up to 10,000 initially, and then every job will get an extra environment variable that tells you the index within the array. And so you can use that index environment variable to uh, be part of a hashing algorithm to get copy-specific behavior, um, or use that as a key to look up a, a copy-specific behavior from DynamoDB or from a, a CSV file that you're storing in S3 that's one of the parameters for your job. And so what this means is that if you submit a job that has, you know, job B is the name, um, and it has a job ID with a string of digits and some hyphens in it, uh, we'll create, with, with 10 copies, um, you'll have elements You'll have uh, 10 jobs in your queue uh, uh, with that same job ID, but colon zero, colon one, colon two, through, through nine. And uh, you can, of course, submit these jobs using the, the AWS Batch console. Um, here's where you would specify the, the array size. Uh, but you'll, you'll notice that we also have uh, some updates to the dependency model with, uh, with, batch, uh, with array job submissions. So uh, I'd like to talk about those in a little bit more detail now. So he here's a, a very simple array job submission. The, uh, the interesting bits are, are happening right here, where you specify the array properties and the, the number of copies you'd like to have in your array job. 
Um, and, uh, but you can also express dependencies. So you can, in this example, you can have an array job uh, that has 100 elements in this example uh, being submitted by, you know, with, with a name of, of job A. And then you, you can have a non-array job, a, a single copy job, that will only begin to execute once all elements have completed within the initial array job. You can invert this and have an array job, of course, that, that only starts once a, a preceding non-array job has completed. Relatively straightforward. Uh, here's where the fun starts, though. Uh, we have a, a dependency model called N2N. And so if you have a, a three-step pipeline that you want to run across 10,000 elements, maybe it's 10,000 objects in an S3 bucket, or maybe it's 10,000 genomes that you want to process, you need to perform three operations on every one of those, those elements or, or those objects, you could do that with three job submission APIs. Uh, one for, for the first step, one for the second step, one for the third step. And in the end-to-end -end dependency model, what we'll do is we'll create an implicit uh, interdependency between the elements such that when element 42 of job A completes, we'll then proceed to uh, what will cause element 42 of job B to become runnable and, and be scheduled as soon as there's a resource available. Uh, this is regardless of whether uh, other elements in job A have completed or not. Uh, we also have a model where you can specify a dependency within a single job. So if you want to give us a job that has 20 steps um, and tell us that the job depends on itself, we will uh, set up interdependencies so we'll run state, uh, element zero, then one, then two, then three sequentially. And um, you can also combine uh, some of these dependency models. So in this case, we have two jobs, A and B, that are non-array. And only once both of those are completed will we then begin to run job C. But as individual elements in job C have completed, then the corresponding elements in job D can begin. You can also express dependencies on specific elements of, of your job. And a, a dependency that's expressed on a 10,000 element array job, for example, uh, would only count as one of the, the dependency limits for your, for your jobs. Uh, so at the moment, we have a, a constraint of, of 20 dependencies for any given job. Um, that, that array job would only count for one of those. And so this is really helpful if you want to have a, a deterministic workflow, potentially with lots of, of fan out and fan back in operations, uh, where each stage might have different resource requirements. You combine this with per second billing, and you can have a, a 10 second operation that's performing a, a heavy network IO stage. Uh, followed by a CPU and then a memory intensive stage, then maybe a, a GPU intensive phase to, to wrap things up. So now getting into the, the roadmap for AWS Batch, uh, just quickly summarizing what you can expect in, in 2018. Uh, first, we, we've, we've heard loud and clear that uh, we need to improve the AWS Batch console. We, we've uh, increased the size of the, of the web development team supporting the AWS Batch uh, console, and we're uh, looking forward to, to making it far easier for you to use. Uh, not just keeping up with the, the capabilities that we're adding, but, but starting to add uh, more telemetry and monitoring uh, capabilities, allowing you to, to very quickly be able to hone in on the status of, of the, the AWS batch jobs that, that you care about. Uh, we'll also be um, making it easier for you to submit jobs in response to events. So uh, in, the, in the coming weeks, very soon actually, uh, you'll be able to have uh, particular job definitions that will uh, be used to, to submit a job to an AWS batch job queue when events that match a particular filter um, occur. So if an object arrives in S3, maybe it's a, a video file that needs to be transcoded, is written to a particular bucket, that event signaling that that object's now existing in S3 could be used to automatically trigger a, a transcoding job with an AWS batch, uh, as, as one example. Uh, we'll also be adding uh, support for CloudTrail auditing. We already uh, support CloudTrail auditing of the um, underlying services that we operate on, on your behalf. Uh, but this will, this will add support to the AWS Batch API calls themselves. So you can tell who's submitting jobs. You can uh, keep track of who canceled jobs or terminated jobs. Uh, an important capability that, that we've heard from a, a number of our customers that are, are using AWS Batch to run jobs uh, that leverage licensed software, as one example, um, is the need to be able to schedule not just based on, on compute requirements of a job, the CPU and the memory needs of a job, but also based on uh, availability of licenses within a pool. And so we'll be adding a feature to Batch called Consumable Resources, where you'll be able to define an integer that, that corresponds to a, a limited resource that you have at your disposal. And if your job has a dependency on that, um, maybe in addition to dependencies in other jobs, we'll actually only begin to run your job or, or transition to runnable when we have both available compute resources and also when uh, that uh, consumable resource is uh, greater than zero. When the job starts, we'll decrement from that, that consumable resource, and when the job completes, we'll increment that. Um, expect additional job types for AWS Batch, um, including the ability to run uh, jobs that span more than one EC2 instance. 
and uh, uh, finally we'll be expanding into a number of other regions. So with, uh, with the time that we have remaining, uh, I'd now like to hand it over to, to Miko uh, Yola from AdRoll to talk about AdRoll's uh, experiences using Batch. Thank you. Thank you. OK, hello, everyone. My name is Mikko Juola, and I'm going to here deliver AdRoll's customer story on AWS Batch. So the first thing what I'm going to talk about a bit is why AdRoll likes AWS Batch. And after that, I'll go a bit on the technical side of stuff. What kind of tooling have we built on AWS Batch and the problems that we face and so on. So let's begin. Yep. So here are some numbers about adoption rates at, of AWS Batch at AdRoll. So we started using it around six months ago in June, not long after AWS Batch itself <laughs> became available in US West 2. And as of today, starting from left, we have two themes at AdRoll who are using AWS Batch in production. And one of the themes is attribution to main user, which I am part of. The attribution team's responsibility that AdRoll is to look at, like AdRoll is an advertising company. We show display advertising on the internet. We go through previous days of all the data, and we come up with numbers like how well this advertising campaign performed, and we put them on a dashboard for the customer to see. So we kind of report on the bottom line of advertising performance in the eyes of the customer, which is, which is important work. So moving on, so far we have submitted 1.2 million jobs. As of today, we submit around 5,000 jobs per day. So we're a heavy user of AWS Batch. We have churned about 300,000 instances so far. If you do some mathematics, you can maybe figure that one instance on average runs about four jobs in our use. And finally, this is an estimation. We have spent 600 CPU years on AWS Batch. And the keyword really here is spent. We have paid money for 600 CPU years. So not everything is 100% efficient. But it's, uh, it's still pretty good, in my opinion. So then why does Adro like AWS Batch? So my first point may be obvious to you if you're like a Docker enthusiast. It's the, the Docker is very flexible. I can pick up any code. I can put it inside the Docker container. And when I submit that job to the system, I can be pretty sure it will actually work. In just the attribution team at Adrol, we have a pretty diverse set of technologies. We have C code, we have Python code, we have Go code, we have some Rust code, and then we have my personal favorite, we have some Haskell code. And we run all of that on a daily basis on AWS Batch. And it works really well. And my second point is that AWS Batch, the conceptual model is pretty simple. I put my stuff in the Docker image, and I submit it away. And AWS Batch will figure out how to scale up and down and so on. And the reason this is beneficial is that when I'm trying to teach the system to a new engineer or someone, maybe some other team at Adderall wants to take use of it, they can be productive on day one, since they don't really have to understand much how this actually works. They don't have to care about scaling or anything. So it really saves time when I'm trying to onboard new people to this stuff. And as we know, time is money, so we're saving money on that as well. And then we have, this is what I like. We have a lot of control over how AWS Batch, the workers, actually run. Like, uh, we can specify our custom AMI, which we do. We install some custom software on it. We change some settings and so on. So we are kind of like control freaks, and we like that, that it gives us the flexibility like that. And finally, the cost efficiency. Especially now, if you've been paying attention, EC2 now has per second billing. So when I submit some jobs to the system and then the jobs finish, AWS Batch kills the instances very quickly after the idle. So we don't pay for anything extra, which is really cost efficient. Adderall uses spot instances exclusively. The instance types we're interested in, they're almost always available on the spot market. And I think for batch jobs in particular, the spot instances are pretty great. So that's, uh, that's good stuff. So that's about why we're using this thing. So next up, I'm going to go into some technical stuff, like what kind of tooling we built on this thing, since there are some pain points in there that we addressed. And my first, the biggest thing that we had was monitoring capabilities of batch jobs. So when we're running a few thousand jobs per day, like I said, we run about 5,000 as of today. And when I come to work tomorrow, in my phone, I might have like an automated email alert that, hey, this S3 file did not come into existence last night for some reason, or these numbers were not inserted into the database. 
that's when I want to go back to my batch jobs and find out which job failed or which job misbehaved and something. So technically, I can go to the AWS Management Console on the AWS Batch tab, and all the information will be there. But right now, the search is not so good as we would hope it to be. It's difficult to find your job out of all those thousands of jobs. And in attribution, we have a pretty diverse set of jobs anyway, so it really gets mixed up. So the solution that we came up with is that we built a monitoring tool, which is called the Batchy Patchy. It's a, yeah, it's an internal tool. We could come up with any kind of name we wanted. So we call it the Batchy Patchy. <laughs> so there's a bunch of things happening here in this UI. And I wanted to highlight some of the uh, important parts in here. So on, the, on top right, we have a search box. Right now, I wrote CoreDB in that search box. And it automatically, very quickly, shows me all the jobs that match the keywords in this search. And this search, we spend a lot of time making it really good. As in, it's very fast. All the results will come in less than one second, even though we have 1.2 million <coughs> jobs in the database. And I can also put things like a S3 URL in the search. And it will also find jobs that somewhere in their command line refer to this S3 path. So if some file is missing, I can very quickly find it this way. At least, mostly. It's not always easy anyway. Finally, we have this job queue over here. So if you have, uh, right now it's selected to, I don't know if you can read it, attribution managed spot staging, which means it's attribution job queue using job spot instances, and it's managed. As of today, all of our compute environments are managed. So different teams have their own job queues, and they can select it, and they don't get mixed up with attribution jobs and so on. So it's like everyone can use the same tool, and they don't have to maintain their own copies, which is nice. We're saving more resources. And finally, there's the status. We have the, all the jobs on the same listing, succeeded, failed, running, whatsoever. And the reason this is notable is because in the actual management tool, the jobs are broken down by different tabs, which sometimes makes things a little difficult. It's difficult to glance what's going on with the system especially if you have like a large number of jobs going on all the time. And also, the search here is not that great. Although, if you were paying attention, this thing is going to get better in 2018. And after that, maybe this tool will not be as necessary back then. So <laughs> going on, we have a, we wrote the Python library to make the submitting the jobs as easy as possible. So there's a lot of things you can tune in AWS Batch, change all kinds of settings and so on. But on an organizational level at Adderall, most of those things will be the same. So we kind of hid away as much complexity as we could and just expose the things that people will actually change. Here we have an image name, which is Ubuntu 16.04 here. We have the name of the job. It'll show up in Batchy Patchy. I have the job queue. I want to submit the job. I have the command line. And I have a timeout, which is set to one hour. If the job doesn't finish in one hour, we have a script that kills it. It's a pretty good feature, and it has its own slide. So there is no built-in support for timeouts in AWS Batch right now. But as I mentioned, when we run a large number of jobs, event eventually you will have some that get stuck for whatever reason. Maybe there's crappy code in there. We have a lot of different diverse set of jobs. Some of them will fail in a way that doesn't actually kill the job. It just gets stuck. And this is a problem. The instance will stay alive forever until we manually kill it. So we spend money on that. And maybe worse is that other jobs may wait on that job. So it'll be just there until something actually done something about the job. So the solution we did, at job submit time, we put an environment variable on the job. It says batch timeout. It has the timestamp when the job should die. And then we have a script runs every one minute, it checks all the jobs that have defined this batch timeout. And if it's later than, if it's expired, then we just, that job is going to die. Which is, uh, this is a really useful feature. Like, I think this becomes relevant when you have very large number of jobs and much more jobs that you can handle. So you want some automatic way to actually kill those that get stuck and so on. It's kind of full tolerance type of feature. Finally, I have some other tricks that we do, but I don't think are as important. As I mentioned, we customize the workers. We have a custom AMI, install some custom software in there. We make great use of Instance Store, especially on i3 instances. They have really fast SSD drives. We use it as a scratch space. It's very good. 
And then we have production and staging environments completely separated. I think it's a good idea to have production at least separated from staging and testing, so there is no chance of them interfering with each other, although it's a bit more expensive since they're not sharing any instances and so on. But it's like you get more, if you pay more, then you get more reliability as well. Oh, yeah, and then AWS Batch can give you like an optimal type of instance, but the way we have set it up is that we have one job queue for a very specific type of instance. So when I submit a job, I know exactly what kind of instance I'm going to get, which is relevant for the disk stuff mostly, but that's like how we like to do things. This is my last slide. So I talked about the monitoring tools and the timeouts and so on, and it may seem like you need to have all kinds of complicated stuff in here, but that's not exactly true. When we started at AdRoll, we just went to the console and clicked, hey, let's create compute environment and job queues and submit jobs using both two and so on. And it worked just fine. When we grew up our use of AWS Batch, then we started to see all the needs for these timeouts and monitoring and stuff. And I think the monitoring is the one thing. If you're going to scale up your use of AWS Batch, you may want to think about how you're going to monitor them in the use case that I described. So it doesn't have to be a UI like I showed. It could be like a CSV file of all the jobs that have failed. You have some script that tells them what they are. Or you can wait until the AWS Management Console gets better in this regard. And finally, I want to stress this because this is really useful cache saving feature. Use the spot instances. Unless you have very specific needs, I think you almost always can use spot instances for batch jobs. They're really good in, because the batch jobs are, are already kind of like ephemeral. They will die very quickly anyway. So you don't usually need the kind of reliability you need from services that run web servers that run all the time and so on. Spot instances, they're great. And I think that's all I have to say. Thank you for listening. I will hand it to uh, All right, so I'm, my name is Ryan Lair with Base2 Genomics. So we're a, a small startup that we spun out of the University of Utah Human Genetics Department so that we could commercialize the software that we developed and optimized in our academic lab. So we, by putting on this other hat, allows us to focus on cost and scale, which are improvements that really wouldn't have led to new publications and new papers, but are very important to hospitals, pharmaceutical companies, and genetic testing labs. And these are exactly the partners that we need if we want our software helping patients. So the excitement of whole genome sequencing is that it represents the ultimate genetic test. Once we extract DNA from a patient and we sequence it, we're left with about 100 million short sequences that completely characterize the patient's genetic code. And our software mines this data looking for signals of genetic disorders. Cost and scale are very important here because as sequencing gets cheaper, we're looking at not one patient at a time, but thousands of patients. So there are other people operating in this space, but they, by and large, are focused on just one type of mutations. These are the, the ones that affect just one or a few of the three billion bases in your genome. And they largely ignore big forms of variations like duplications and deletions that can affect millions of bases and are hallmarks of many gen genetic disorders, most notably cancer. So our opinion is why go through the trouble of sequencing an entire genome if you're just gonna shine a light on one type of variation? At Base2 Genomics, we wanna illuminate the entire space and give doctors access to the full spectrum of genetic variation that may exist in their patients. So to do this, we use a, a really simple architecture. This is like the, the batch smiley face. We store all of our files on S3, and we process them in batch, and we write the results back to S3. That's because we have very large files, and our pipeline is heterogeneous, and I, I mean that in a very broad sense. We have a mixture of open source, commercial, and our own proprietary software. All of these have different CPU and memory requirements, and at different stages in the pipeline, we have different types of both task and data parallelism. And we're able to to uh, 
accomplish all of this because of all of the services that AWS provides through Batch. All right, so the, to kind of dive into our pipeline, I'm gonna go through one specific example where we looked at a UN sarcoma study. So this is a form of, of fairly rare childhood cancer. And as I move along, I'm gonna pay particular attention to how we parallelized our analysis so we can get this done cheaply and quickly. And I also have this little ticker in the corner so you can get an idea of the scale of just one experiment. We're gonna look at both how much data are we pulling and pushing to S3 and how many CPU hours we spend operating on that data. All right, so we start with raw sequencing data. In this case, we had 1,049 samples. So that's 50 terabytes of, of raw data. The first step in this is called, uh, it's called alignment, where you take each one of those sequences and you have 100 million per sample, and we take that short sequence and we look up where that exists in the human reference genome. So this is a, like a string search problem. And we do that so we can look at one spot in the genome across all of our samples looking for mutations in, in that area. So we do this to every sample, so we call this sample parallel. So we take all of our samples and we're gonna look at just one of them, maybe, yeah. We're gonna look at just one sample, but this is data parallel, so we're doing this to all samples. So we take the 50 gigabytes of raw data for this sample and we send the alignment job to batch. To make this job submission uh, step a little bit easier, much like the, the last speaker, we have this now open source tool we call Batchit. And this makes job submission to Batch look a lot like job submission to a, something like Slurm, a, a queuing system on a cluster, which is something that we're very familiar with. So if, you, if you're interested in Batch, please check out our, our GitHub page. So the way, the way it works is you start by defining a generic shell script where you've replaced all of the command line parameters and options with variables, and then you submit that shell script to Batch using a, a pretty simple batch it submit operation, where you define things like the Docker image, the, the roles, the queues, uh, the environmental variables. But one of the really interesting things that we added was uh, something that gets around this disk space issue that's in Batch. So the, the default AMIs basically have no storage, you can do a custom AMI and mount either local storage or attach an EBS volume, but you're stuck with that mount for the entirety of, of the instance. And if you're, you're running multiple jobs on an instance, then you're gonna have a lot of multi-tenancy issues. The, the most troubling of those issues is how big should this mount be? So you need to estimate you know, how much disk space is the maximum for all of my jobs, times the number of jobs I'm gonna be running on each instance. And if you have a heterogeneous pipeline like us, you're gonna, that estimation is probably going to be much larger than your actual usage. So you're wasting a lot of money on space that you're not going to use. So what we figured out is a way to dynamically attach EBS volumes directly to your jobs. We mount them and then when the job's over, we, we unmount them, delete them and, and detach them. So with the per second uh, billing with EBS now, you were able to save a lot of money. And this is, this is really important to us because our EBS costs are a large fraction of our, our total costs. And I'll get into uh, exactly how we do that in a, in, a, in a couple slides. So Batch uses the Go API to transform these command line parameters to this, uh, to this JSON. We submit that to the, uh, the, the uh, submit jobs API. And it, it yeah, so and it gives us, uh, this uh, result. So the interesting, pit, uh, interesting bits here are where we, submit the, we set the command line variables, we encode the job, and then we set the stage for mounting the EBS. All right, to do the mount the EBS, we wrap a little bit of bash around the main execution. Uh, we first have this uh, initial batch it command where we do our EBS mount, and you can set things like the properties of the EBS, uh, the file format, all sorts of interesting parameters there. And then to unmount, we have a trap. And in that trap, we unmount, and then we have another batch it command that makes sure to delete and detach that EBS volume. All right, so um, the plumbing that makes all of this possible was actually inspired by Andre's Agia um, tool suite. And what you do is you just, you uh, map the 
instance uh, dev to the container dev. All right, so once you run that, batch returns your job ID, and you can use that to set up your dependencies. All right, so we run uh, all, of our, all of our jobs on compute environments that have a pretty diverse set of instances in them. Uh, we started looking, you know, like the previous speaker, we really liked the i3 because it had all of that local storage and we thought we could save a lot of money. But the pricing of this is just way too unstable for us. We, we could never really get good spot prices very consistently. So we had to switch our, our architecture to use jobs that had a profile like this, things that were much more stable and we can get predictable pricing over time. All right, so with this, um, you know, with Batchit and with this diverse set of instances, we can align a full genome, <coughs> excuse me, uh, for one individual, it's about 100 gigabytes of data. We do that in uh, about seven compute days. You do that across 1,049 instant, uh, samples, we're now up to um, 100 terabytes of data and about 20 CPU years. So that's just the first step in the pipeline. Now we have this aligned genome, so we know where all of those 100 million sequences originated from for every sample. We now go through and analyze that data looking for these uh, mutations. So we stay with the idea of sample parallel here, and this step is what we call variant calling. So you have your sample, and there are kind of two stages here. I talked about the, the two different forms of variation. So there's the small variance, which most people look at, and then you also here you have some task parallelism along with your data parallelism, parallelism. So in parallel, we do this large variant calling, which is really the specialty uh, of our academic lab and is now the specialty of, of base two. And as you look at the CPU requirements, it is drastically cheaper to call these large variants. So, you, so for just a little bit of extra money and, and given the parallelism, no extra time, you're able to get the full spectrum of, of variation uh, across all of your samples. So you do that for all of the samples. We're now up to uh, 287 terabytes of data and 35 compute years. And at this point, you have all of the genetic variants, all of the mutations for all of your samples. Now we need to do something we call joint calling, where you take all of that data and you put it into one central location so you can really start to dig in and look for you know, what makes the people sick, what makes some people well. So we call that joint calling. And we switch gears here to something called region parallel. So it's no longer sample parallel. So what I mean by that is we take a genome, we divide it up into individual regions, and then for each region, we pull all of the mutations we identified in the prior step for all of our samples, and we join them, we, we joint call all of those variants into a single unified, uh, you know, uh, single unified file. So to do this, we have about 80 regions across the human genome uh, we do, we have, and the final tally here is about 300 terabytes of data and 35 CPU years for this, for this one experiment. But the really nice thing about batch is given the resources that are available there, we actually did this in just over three days. And you know, we could have doubled the number of, in, uh, number of uh, uh, CPUs in our, in our compute environments that have done this in, in less than two days. And I think it's really exciting because in just a few days, we, we produce all of this data and then we actually, uh, our collaborators in this project are writing new papers and finding uh, new reasons why one population of people might be more prone to this form of childhood cancer than other populations. It's actually a really exciting uh, results we have here. Uh, so there's a lot of challenges uh, that we have to face. The, the most striking is, is using academic software. So academic software is the cutting edge of statistical models and, and algorithms, but it's not always written in a way that is, is easily digestible by batch. And in particular, exit codes are not faithfully reported uh, in this software. So we have, we have many instances where we have some catastrophic error and all of the output is truncated, but you check exit code zero. So batch has no way, batch has no way of knowing that it should report or maybe even retry. So what we had to do is we have to develop this infrastructure where after every result, we go through and we validate the output and we create a Sentinel file on S3 if that uh, file is valid. 
what these sentinels do is allow us to move from event dependencies that uh, Batch provides to data dependent uh, infrastructure or data dependent um, you know, job planning. And we do that with uh, software that we developed called Base2Mon. So for Base2Mon, a little simple example, you give it a set of input files and you get a set of operations. And from that, it knows all of the dependencies and all the parallelism that might exist in these operations, and it can completely orchestrate a data-dependent pipeline where it knows all of the synchronization points, it knows uh, all, of the, all of the parallelism task and data, and, and it runs pretty easily. It's a very small service that runs on a T2 micro, and it takes all these inputs. It Once the uh, Sentinels exist on S3, it submits new jobs to batch, and the whole time it actually monitors all of those instances. And what this gives us is this, you know, a data-dependent pipeline, you can basically tear down every job you have and restart for almost free. So recovery and restart are, are, are a given. We also use this to modularize a lot of that third-party software that we're using. And, and a really nice piece here is because we're monitoring these jobs, when they fail, we can look for characteristic memory errors and we resubmit we can actually change the parameters, give it more memory, so it's unlikely to fail again. Uh, and the, the real-time instance monitoring gives us a good idea of how much time and how much cost we're incurring. All right, so that, that's all I have. Uh, please visit our website or, or, um, or tweet at us if you're interested in uh, knowing more about Batch or Batchit. Um, it's all on our GitHub site or, or you know, more of how we're using Batch. So thank you very much. Hey everybody, how are you guys doing? You tired? Well, imagine I have to do a presentation up here. Okay, so <clears throat> I work for Autodesk. And at Autodesk, we do many things, uh, but our core business is CAD software. CAD stands for Computer Aided Design and is extensively used in various industries, um, such as automotive, aerospace, shipbuilding, uh, industrial and architectural designs, uh, prosthetics, and a bunch more. We're always looking to improve uh, the way our customers design things, and this talk is about uh, one such new way. In general terms, the goal of any engineering activity is to strike a balance between uh, the performance of what you're trying to do and cost of making that specific thing. Uh, for simplicity's sake, consider uh, you have to come up with a mechanical part, such as you see here on your screen, uh, that this will eventually need to be manufactured. And um, the challenge is basically how would you approach this, this, this problem? Um, one way to do design is basically what um, General Electric did in 2013. They created a crowdsourced design challenge for a jet engine bracket. You see it on your screen. They asked the public to come up with an um, optimal design for a mechanical part according to certain specifications they published, and uh, you know, such as strength, weight, and so on. Um, for this challenge, there are about 700 uh, designs submitted. From, by people across 53 different countries, and it took about two months in total. Most of these satisfied the requirements that uh, GE asked for. Imagine how many of these could have been created by a single designer or a design team with a limited amount of time. You might have noticed from the previous slide that uh, the design phase doesn't actually deal just with shapes, but also uh, needs to take into consideration things like the processes that you're going to use to actually make your thing, uh, materials that you're going to have, and the cost for it all. So how are we moving uh, away from the old ways of designing, producing designs by hand, and uh, into you know, new and automated ways um, such as the generative design. The old way, also known as convergent design, 
uh, it's, engineers are limited in time and energy that they can spend on any number of designs that they can produce. Uh, so they can't explore uh, fully the design space. Uh, the results are limited design options. Enter generative design. So generative design is a, uh, with generative design software, you input your design goals, uh, such as the materials, manufacturing methods, and the costs into our software. Um, then using cloud computing, uh, the system generates multiple designs for you. Basically, the computer creates the designs and in, for, instead of you. Generative design is also known as a divergent, di divergent design. Uh, there is no single solution. Instead, uh, you potentially get thousands of great solutions. Uh, and it's like having your own crowdsource challenge, the way General Electric did with their design challenge, but much quicker. You don't have to wait for months and months and uh, hundreds of people to do it for you. Once you get the potential designs from our system, it's up to you to select the ones that fits your need best along that price performance curve. This is uh, the workflow for our software doing the generative design and uh, basically deals uh, with the first three steps here. Uh, the second, the, the fourth through sixth steps are what you would do to eventually produce. But we're gonna focus on the first three here. So. The way it works is you define uh, and input your project requirements into our software. Then our software generates uh, a number of variants uh, for each project. Um, you can think of it uh, in terms of the part that I showed earlier. If you had to make that, um, the variants would be different material types. So let's say uh, you know, one is gonna be steel, another one is gonna be an aluminum, and the third one would be wood. These three variants, then get solved, what we call solved, uh, as in uh, the geometry for the actual part gets generated um, and is uh, done in parallel. So you can imagine if you have stronger materials, you can have thinner uh, diameters for pieces of your parts versus the other way around if you have something like wood. Then in the third step, you explore all the solutions that you got, all the designs, and you can uh, choose the one that fits your best. Again, again uh, along that price performance uh, curve. So how, do we, uh, how did we implement this on, on AWS? We basically used these three services. Uh, and I'm, th these are the ones that I'm gonna focus most. Of course, we used a bunch of other ones that uh, are less important. So we use ECS, um, we use uh, Simple Workflow, and we use Batch. In case uh, you guys are not familiar with Simple Workflow, it's a state machine. Um, it, it, was, it was a great fit for what we needed to coordinate our um, jobs on batch, and it saved us from having to write our own. This is the architecture that we use for our um, generative design software. A project gets submitted to the API service uh, running on, on ECS which triggers a workflow in SWF. So we have basically a one-to-one -one matching between a project and a workflow in, S in Swift. Um, the generate um, step from the workflow I, I showed you guys earlier, the second step basically, consists of two phases. One is generating the variants uh, what I was mentioning earlier about, you know, for example, material types. Uh, and then the second, uh, so, so this first phase happens in just one container. So one container gets spin up uh, in a batch job with one container gets spin up uh, and creates the, all the variants. And the second phase um, is solving each of those variants uh, and it happens in parallel. So another batch job gets submitted and, you know, be that three or a hundred, uh, or a thousand uh, variants, they all get happen in parallel. We have two uh, managed computer environments in batch. Uh, for the first phase, we use a CPU cluster for generating the variants, and we use an optimal instance type. We don't really care what batch picks for us. The second cluster, the second phase is a GPU cluster for solving the variants. Uh, we found, uh, we started with CPU uh, clusters, but then um, 
did some benchmarks and found out the GPU cluster is actually a better fit for us. We had to create a custom AMI, and we had to restrict our instance types that we use in batch to P2. Uh, we have just two job queues corresponding to uh, both of these clusters, so it's really simple. Here's how uh, our job definition for the solver piece, for the solver job looks like. You can see that it's really simple, and the stuff in bold is basically what you would need as a minimum uh, job definition. The other stuff is, uh, since this is, a, uh, this is a job definition for a GPU uh, job, it, it basically deals with setting up the NVIDIA drivers and all this other stuff. Our code uses Go, so this is a simple sample on how we actually submit the job. Uh, it's very, again, very, it's trivial, honestly. Um, just need to give it the job definition, um, the job name, and the job queue. You can do some overrides as well if you need to, but that's all you need uh, with the AWS SDK uh, for Go. So I have a little demo, which I'm not quite sure how to play. Do you know how we start the video? Yeah, so it was showing up here. So if you can click. Oh. Uh, there we go. Oh, I see. Okay, so this is how it looks in action. Like, assume you have to do a part that would connect the three green dots, but then keep the space that you just saw in red um, empty. Our software would generate the variants, so these are all the variants, and then fill the geometry for each of them. Then you can explore it and look at them and, and choose the one that fits best for your uh, project. You can sort by various uh, characteristics. Uh, you can um, you can see, the, basically, uh, you know, look around. And uh, finally, you can explore it you know, on, on that price performance curve. Not necessarily price. Uh, and, and performance, you can also sort, you know, have the curve you know, based on the strength of the part or the material that it's used. Um, so you can easily get you know, hundreds of designs for a solution, so hundreds of designs for a problem that would you know, take humans much, much longer to make on their, on, on their own. With uh, generative design so far, uh, we started using this uh, about six months ago, uh, more seriously, and uh, we've created uh, 2,200 studies, uh, about 10 times uh, more uh, design uh, options were computed. This is just an example of um, what you can get you know, if you input, uh, if your problem is to create a bike frame. And lastly, um, we actually used uh, our um, generative design software to uh, generate the floor plan for our Toronto office. And um, we, we inputted things like you know, how, the number of desks we needed, the, the widths of the corridors, the space between them, and so on, and you know, uh, got a bunch of options, which we finally um, converged on and they built. Uh, from one of those who actually built our, our new office that way. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Nice job. Uh, thanks, Tito. That's really exciting. I had a chance to visit Autodesk's office in San Francisco, and they, they had actually a number of quadcopter designs that were, were generated using the, this generative design technique. And as somebody who likes to fly quadcopters, it was amazing to see all the different variations uh, that, that are created by this and how each were optimized for, for cost or, or for uh, longevity of flight or, or other attributes. Uh, really cool application of the service. Uh, so just to, to summarize, um, I wanted to you know, close out with, before we go to questions, uh, with a, a few links. Um, 
the, all of our slides will be posted. You, you can find them on, on SlideShare and on YouTube within a couple of days of, of today's talk. Um, just some links to the to the sample code for um, for the batch and step functions integration. Um, we'll also be um, tweeting and finding other ways to get out links to uh, to batch it and some of the other tools that uh, our presenters have open sourced and, and a few other open source projects that have emerged around AWS Batch in the past month or so. Uh, and so with that, I'd like to thank everybody for your time. And uh, with the, the remaining five or so minutes, uh, I'd like to take any questions that you have. Uh, there's a, a microphone over here. And uh, also, if we have a, a few other folks who weren't able to join us on stage for the presentation, but they're available to, to answer questions, um, Aaron and Brent and, and Oleg. Uh, so uh, any questions? Sure. Yeah, sorry to, to zip past that. Yeah, you have a question. So yeah, question is, is there any time, any time frame for Windows support? Uh, so we, we already support Windows in unmanaged compute environments today. So if you uh, have a, a containerized Windows application that you'd like to run on, on AWS Batch, um, you create a, a compute environment using the Windows ECS optimized AMI, and then you can submit jobs uh, just as you would if, if those were running Linux applications. Um, as uh, the, the support for uh, Windows transitions from, from beta to, to GA within the EC2 container service, you can expect that we'll quickly follow suit and support Windows workloads in AWS Batch um, as, as a first class citizen. Yeah. Yeah, the only thing that we don't do right now is, is uh, provisioning of, of your, your Windows EC2 instances, but uh, that's something that, that we would be doing as a, as a follow up to uh, ECS supporting uh, Windows containers as, as a GA. At the moment, yes. At the moment, yes. Yes, oh, sorry, yes. Yeah, the question is, will there be support for GovCloud in the future? Uh, absolutely. Uh, so as you saw on our roadmap slide, regional expansion kind of continuing from one region last year this time to nine today. Uh, we're going to round out the, the remaining regions that we don't yet support um, very early in, in 2018. So GovCloud, I, I, my, my time at Amazon, I've had the opportunity to work with uh, customers like NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, who helped us define the requirements for the, for the GovCloud region. Uh, it's very high on our, on our priority list to be able to support ITAR-sensitive workloads. Any other questions? On the right. Yes. OK, question is, do we uh, have any plans to support EM, you know, things that you can run in an EMR cluster, Elastic MapReduce cluster, like Spark jobs? Uh, so we actually have a number of customers that are running Spark jobs within AWS Batch today. They're running single node Spark. Um, and so you can get quite a few vCPUs on an, on an EC2 instance today. Um, but we, we actually, with the, the support for um, uh, jobs that can span multiple instances, we expect that to be one of the, the workloads that, that would be possible on, on batch. Um, also, looking at, at workloads like MPI or, or other tightly coupled applications. Was there another question over here, too? Okay, you're helping find it. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? One in the back. Okay, yeah, uh, great, a great question. So, uh, asking if we have plans to support. Uh, time-based scheduling. So instead of you know, scheduling based on compute resources, uh, calendar and, and, and wall clock scheduling. Uh, so today, the, the way that you do that is uh, setting up a CloudWatch scheduled event, which supports cron, cron syntax. That triggers a Lambda function, which then submits the job to AWS Batch. Um, so one, one of the features on our near-term roadmap is the ability to have um, an event automatically trigger the submission of an AWS Batch job. That would, make, that would uh, you know, eliminate one of the services from that picture. Um, we want to simplify that. Much like Lambda has scheduled Lambda function execution, they, they use CloudWatch scheduled events behind the scenes for that. Um, we'll be doing something very similar uh, with, the, with the AWS Batch console. Uh, we'll also be looking at, at other scheduling algorithms, uh, scheduling in terms of uh, expressing things like the, uh, the resource requirements, the, the, the uh, maximum or estimated duration for your job and the budget so that we can pick the most cost-effective time to run your workload. Uh, so deadline scheduling and, and uh, other scheduling algorithms. Great. Uh, well, with no more questions, uh, I'd like to round of applause again for all of our, our fantastic presenters. Thank you.